Bob Scully's World Show is brought to you by Fiera Capital. The power of thinking, optimal performance, intelligent innovation. Hi, this is Bob Scully, and welcome to another edition of The World Show, Free Markets, The Fiera Series, coming to you this week from Miami, where we're going to talk about money. That's right, money, the eternal topic. It can't buy you love, maybe, but it sure does a whole bunch of other things, and we're certainly fascinated and scared by it. Well, this week we're going to meet one of the world's greatest specialists, Lawrence White, professor of economics at George Mason University, who can explain, for instance, why the Great Recession of 08 was so painful compared to previous recessions, and who can talk about one of his passions, free banking. You heard me right, free banking. Here's Professor White. Professor White, um, uh, a few years ago, I remember talking to Milton Friedman, and I told him, I served him up the cliche, I said, you know, the dismal science, they never agree, and, right. and there's, a, there's a famous sentence that may or may not be from George Bernard Shaw saying the same thing. Right. And yet, in your book called The Clash of Economic Ideas, in the very first paragraph you take care to say that's not quite true. That's what Friedman told me. He said, you know, you're wrong. Economists can agree on all kinds of things. There's just a few they don't. And so those, among those few, however, is that pendulum between um, Keynes and Hayek, between two views of the economy. Where yeah. does that stand now? Well, it's still true that there are a lot of issues, free trade, for example, in which there's pretty strong consensus among economists. But my book is devoted to where the arguments have taken place and where sometimes a consensus has emerged and sometimes we're still battling. Uh, but in particular, between Keynes and Hayek, we're battling over macroeconomic policy, mm -hmm. what central banks should do, should central banks even exist, um, are markets self-regulating or this, do we need experts to tell us uh, how to do things? And the pendulum, I'm curious politically where, where it's going, because uh, I would have thought when I was doing Friedman and people like that, that it was going to become a settled question that just throwing helicopter money at, at things just could not keep a, an economy going. And yes. yet, since 08, that's what we've had from people, all the Western governments. People are literally talking about helicopter money. That's right. And is the debt bubble... Uh, going to going to burst at some point. Is it sustainable? Well, it, different countries are in different positions. In the U.S., we've slowed down at least on the accumulation of debt since the worst days of the recession. Uh, the discouraging part is we've had seven years of recovery without mm -hmm. moving into surplus, which you're supposed to do according yeah. to the classical principles. So if it grows even in good times, uh, faster than GDP, and then in bad times grows much faster than GDP, then, yeah, ultimately that's not sustainable. So in the United States, we're above 100% debt to GDP, and other countries are even farther along. So that is discouraging. Um, so we have to hope that is it dangerous? improvements will be made. Well, uh, right now we're not seeing high interest rates on government debt, but that's the danger. The danger is that taxpayers will be forced to fork over more just to service the debt. Um, and in countries like Spain, that's been a very big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the debt service went from something like 20% of the budget to a third of the budget. Uh, so it starts to eat into taxpayers at, seriously at that point and, and cut into other government programs. And, and despite all the, the newfangled labels like quantitative easing and, and whatever you want to call it, it's still the same old trick. You can print money, yes, or you can tighten your belt. That that's really the the, the 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 terrible choice. And politicians will always prefer to print money than ask people to tighten their belt. Yeah, they think it's a free lunch. Uh, how can how can it not make us wealthier if we each have more money in our wallet? But of mm -hmm. course, if there aren't any more goods and services <laughs> to buy, mm -hmm. you're just cheapening the currency, and that's a trick that's been played for centuries. But the, but this time, and in a wait. Uh, because I suppose the, the mumbo jumbo, quantitative easing, and so on, it was kind of disguised. I don't think people have realized yeah. that it is a printing press. Yeah, the, the quantitative easing program in the United States 
at first, a lot of people said, oh, there's going to be a big explosion of inflation. But the Fed actually, in a sense, sterilized it. That is, they are paying banks not to lend the money out. They're paying interest on reserves that mm -hmm. they never paid before. So if you look at the whole package, quantitative easing plus paying the banks not to lend, it's really a, a financial allocation program. It's uh, tinkering with financial markets where the Fed has bought trillions in real estate bonds, mortgage-backed securities. They're trying to prop up uh, housing prices, yeah. keep homeowners thinking that their houses are worth more than they fundamentally are, and thereby, according to Ben Bernanke's theory, that keeps consumer spending and the economy going, but hasn't really had that effect. It's, but the Fed now has this uh, insanely expanded portfolio Banks are sitting on trillions in excess reserves, and it's made the conduct of monetary policy um, in the traditional way impossible. So the Fed is just making it up as they go along now. They're not quite sure what to do, what yeah, levers see, they still the, have. That is scary. You're right. And it that is. is scary. Uh, so they've been talking about targets and indicators. And in fact, in their last conference at Jackson Hole, there was a lot of discussion. What do we do now? Mm -hmm. The old ways don't seem to be working. It seems as if all the countries, including America, are just waiting. They're hoping somewhere, somehow, the normal economy, buying and selling of goods and services, right. will suddenly start to pick up, mm -hmm. and it'll be contagious, and we'll be back to boom times. But nobody knows how to put that spark in. So we have had a slow recovery in the United States. It's at least better than Europe's recovery, <laughs> to say the least. which is completely flatlined. Uh, so that is happening, not as the result of monetary policy, but despite it, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but monetary st policy is still in this box where they've got such a huge balance sheet that they're going to have to shrink that before they can get the same kind of traction uh, it used to have. We were paying ourselves all kinds, um, up to 08, uh, all kinds of compliments in the, in the Western economies, how great yes. we were and innovative and so on. Um, the great some, moderation. Yeah, uh, but, but when, when you look back now, you think, hey, maybe we were just um, partners with the Chinese who were in a great building boom of their own mm -hmm. and selling us stuff and so on, and that could not last, and that's all it was. We were just dancing with the, you know, the nicest girl at the party, and uh -huh. she's gone now. Uh, she's gone somewhere else. And, and uh, you know, I mean, is it really as disheartening as that? Well, if you go to the data, if you just plot what was happening to total output in the economy, it was in an unsustainable bubble before the bubble collapsed. Uh, gross domestic product was above trend, mm -hmm. and it didn't come just back to trend. It went crashing through and went well below trend. And since then, we haven't caught up to the old trend, the bubble path, uh, but we've been paralleling it uh, quite a bit below it. But I think having destroyed a lot of capital by investing in houses that people didn't need, uh, that's the best we're going to be able to do. As long as we keep growing, it's not we're grow, the U.S. economy is growing at somewhat less than two percent, mm -hmm. which used to be considered anemic, but that may be the best we can hope for until we get policies on the real side of the economy that stop discouraging investment so drastically. We've and got a lot of uncertainty about health care yeah, costs, about absolutely. taxes, about future yeah. regulations, and corporations are sitting on lots of retained earnings. There's not much buying enthusiasm shares, about yeah. buying back shares, but not investing in plant and equipment. There's not a lot of enthusiasm for that. Um, and is, is the U.S. lucky, though, when all is said and done to have the world's currency? I mean, everybody needs it, and they issue it, and boy, that's, it's nice to be sitting in that chair. It, it is an exorbitant privilege, as it's been called, yes. So um, for some reason, U.S. Treasury bills are regarded as the safest asset in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's true there's no default risk. They will always be paid back in the number of dollars that's promised. <laughs> But you can't guarantee what those dollars will buy. <laughs> and and uh, something I discovered, well, let's go back in history a little bit because your book is fascinating. And there are things you touch on. Uh, for instance, um, the, uh, and I believe Jim Grant also touches on it, um, the, the depression that wasn't. Um, 1921. 1921. Yeah, yeah. We, we avoided the worst eight years before the worst did hit us. Yeah. Let's, let's go back to that. That was the end of Woodrow Wilson and the beginning of Warren Harding. Yeah, so during the First World War, lots of money was printed to pay for the war effort. And 
the price level rose. There was inflation, 20% a year in a couple of years. Mm. So the price level is much higher than is consistent with the gold standard, which the United States was supposed to be on. And so the choice was either, uh, well, so the, in order to stay on the gold standard at, at the same parity, the price level had to come back down. And in 1921, it came back down most of, most of the way, but very rapidly, and there was a sharp recession. But no active policy was undertaken to try to stimulate the economy. There weren't any uh, attempts to run big deficits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And no, Fed, Keynes no Keynesianism. Right. And the Fed was really waiting for the economy to right itself before they felt it was safe to start cutting interest rates. So interest rates were quite high. Uh, but the economy recovered nonetheless. And then a little bit after the recovery began, the Fed began uh, to ease up on interest rates because they had wanted to wring the excessive high prices out of the system. And so the recession was sharp, but it was very short. And the, you could say the uh, economy recovered on its own. That's the theme of Jim Grant's book. And, and, and uh, I think it's Friedman who, who says um, uh, that it was by accident because uh, Woodrow Wilson had a stroke. And uh, he might have fiddled with it. That's right. Except he was incapacitated. And Harding was not the kind of big thinker to try that. Uh, but the inference here is that maybe that's better. Leave these things alone. Is that your well, Yeah, that, that's the lesson, I think. Yeah, so Harding ran on a return to normalcy, which meant shrink the federal government back to the size it had been before the First World War. And that helped free up resources for putting the economy back on a normal footing. And Hoover and then FDR did not think like that, neither of them. They really went to town trying to solve it. Well, that's right. Uh, when the Great Recession began, uh, Hoover immediately jumped into action. And he wrote a sort of self-justifying uh, autobiography years later in which he says, I was advised to just liquidate everything. Mm -hmm. And he's sometimes quoted as if he followed that advice. But he goes on to say, but we didn't do that. We uh -huh. jumped into action. We built more highways. We ran a bigger deficit. He did Roosevelt before Roosevelt. We, uh, he did in, in many ways. Uh, Roosevelt expanded it. I mean, Roosevelt was bigger. But mm -hmm. Hoover actually called businessmen into the White House and said, although prices are falling, don't cut wages because that would cut into workers' purchasing power. Not seeming to realize that if you don't cut wages when prices are falling, then the workers are being paid more and more in real terms, and you're not going to be able to hire as many at those wages. And so the total amount earned by workers can actually go down because so many fewer are going to be employed. Mm -hmm. People are going to lose their jobs, which of course they did. Uh, in the first three years of the Great Depression, there were enormous job losses. And we have a terror of deflation. It's a dirty word. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned that. And, and the Great Depression made it that way. And maybe we shouldn't. Have, we should. But that's an unusual case. Yeah, so people who've studied seriously the longer sweep of history have found there's no relationship, really, between deflation and depression. A year of deflation is just as likely to be responding to the prices are falling because output is growing. And under the classical gold standard, that's the way it typically was. If output grew faster than the world gold supply, then prices would fall, but it wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. Prices weren't falling because they were unsold inventories. They were falling because productivity was increasing and the cost of production was falling, yeah. so producers could lower their costs and sell more. Like VCRs. And make a profit at yeah. a lower price, like computers today, yeah. yeah. VCRs is a little dated. Yeah, I know, example. I know, I know. I'm showing my age. Um, but, I, but you're right. It's not that deflation is it, it, what struck me is it's a little bit like a cold that you turn into the flu by fiddling too much. You know, yeah, so it, it could be just a cold. Now, the bad deflation is when it's due to collapse in the money supply, people hoarding money or banks hoarding money or shrinkage in the money supply. And that can be treated uh, by providing the money that people want to hold. And sort of the test of that is... Uh, dollar income in the economy stops shrinking, then mm -hmm. you've, you've supplied enough money. Uh, but, and that was the case in the Great Depression, uh, which the Fed failed to apply the right remedy to. But if you don't have a central bank, uh, deflation is generally a very benign process. And central banks bring me to one of the great themes of your work, uh, 
which is free banking. Right. And I was kidding you in the hallway before we started saying free banking, you know, toasters when you open a savings account. That I didn't Well, if you Google know. the phrase, that's what you often yeah, get. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Uh, but I, of course, my ignorance was showing because it's actually um, an entire philosophy of banking. Um, which is a bit scary to a lot of people, but it was even scary to me as I was reading it. What yeah. is free banking? So historically, free banking meant we should allow competition in the issue of currency. Under the gold or silver standard, it would be redeemable for something more fundamental. So mm -hmm. banks couldn't just issue money ad lib. They had to be concerned about actually being able to satisfy the terms of the contract, which say pay to the bearer on demand. So the issue of bank-issued currency was strictly constrained by the gold standard or the silver standard. Uh, and the argument was we should allow competition in the issue of currency rather than have a state monopoly, have a central bank. The origins of central banks lay in the government saying only this bank is now allowed to issue currency. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is now they're in a position to act in ways that are inconsistent with living up to the promise, with actually redeeming their currency when it's called for. And when central banks are allowed to suspend payment, as it was called, uh, there's no legal remedy and the public has nowhere else to turn. So now the whole economy is off the gold standard and who knows what's going to happen. Uh, and typically it takes decades for central banks to get back on the gold standard if they ever do. So it's a way of diversifying the issue of money to actually provide greater safety to the public. And the, the theory goes back to Adam Smith, to the wealth of nations. Adam Smith lived in a free banking system in Scotland, one of the great examples of mm -hmm. a free banking system. Mm -hmm. And he looked around him and said, this works pretty well. Uh, it's better for the public because the failure of any one bank is not a big deal. And the banks have to compete for business, so they have to provide good terms to the public. And they have to be careful not to overissue because the other banks around them will keep them on their toes. And when I but we, we have the, the cultural uh, obstacle, which is how, how people see this yeah. and security and insecurity. And as I was starting to read about it, and it dawned on me what you were advocating, I thought, okay, fine. But somewhere in there is an FDIC in, by another name. And then I read further, and you say, no, no, the, these de these deposits won't be insured. Right. The bank will have to earn your trust by having enough reserves, and you have to trust them that it's true. Otherwise, you'll go to another bank. That's where it gets scary because people are used to doing that with 401ks or their stock portfolio. They entrust it and they keep an eye on it. But their, their daily money, their weekly paycheck, would they ever want to do that at McDonald's Bank or Joe's Bank or Steve's Bank? I wonder. So there's a way, there are several ways, but uh, banks have various ways to guarantee to their note holders that they will get paid. Uh, one is the banks keep adequate capital so that loan losses don't wipe out uh, the net worth of the bank and everybody can be paid. Uh, sometimes, if they were worried about a sudden demand for redemption, banks put a clause in their banknotes that said, at our option, we can delay redemption until we have time to liquidate enough assets that everybody gets paid, rather than if we have to liquidate in a hurry, we might not be able to pay everybody. But one of the most fundamental things banks did was to reserve unlimited liability for their note liabilities. So the note holders got paid first and the shareholders got paid last. And in some systems, uh, the, like shareholders, the shareholders had to chip in more if necessary. And that was the system in Scotland. That was not usually the system in Canada or the United States. Banks had typically limited liability. But we did have private banks lasted in issuing currency, I mean. Yeah. In Canada, certainly, they lasted, I think, into the 20th century. Yeah. Um, so, so it's not that old or that crazy a system. But I imagine in today's world, though... Uh, Once you have deposit insurance... So we used to, in, in the U.S., less so in Canada, we used to weaken banks by restricting them. In the U.S., they weren't allowed to branch across state lines, sometimes even, not even within state lines. We had restrictions on banks' ability to respond to seasonal variations in the demand for currency, again, less so in Canada. Mm -hmm. But now we've weakened banks by giving them protections and privileges, and they've adjusted to it. So we have deposit insurance, and American banks use it, and, and, and deposit insurance is spread to other countries, so the same problem arises. There's 
a great moral hazard problem. Banks no longer have to convince the public that the bank is acting responsibly because the government will pay the depositors even mm -hmm. if the bank fails. So it's worse than it's not So the banks are not so careful. They don't keep adequate reserves. They don't invest as conservatively. You know, the complaint against bankers used to be not that they're taking crazy risks, but that they refuse to take risk. <laughs> so true. you couldn't get a loan unless you needed one, that sort yeah. of thing. You didn't need one, and uh -huh. that sort of thing. Uh, but, but if... if um... So we couldn't remove deposit insurance tomorrow without, you know, letting banks get back into a position where they could reassure the public of their solvency. And if you wanted to do that by having ample reserves, as you've indicated, yeah. so that everybody is very calm, theoretically, the reserves might have to equal the money lent out, then there's no leverage. Then, then the banking system can't develop the economy. Because we like the fact that the banking system takes one dollar and lays yeah. out three. Well, so if we look historically, banks were able to leverage to a certain extent without panicking the public because their assets were sufficient mm -hmm. to pay off their liabilities. They, they had... But they, they'd have to be close to that. But the reserves were not 100%. And so in New York City or wherever in Chicago, you'd have, you'd get your weekly paycheck. How would this work? How would we transition to that? It is interesting. Yeah. Uh, I guess one brave bank would have to go first, and a few brave depositors would have to go to that bank, and then it would be called, you know, White's Bank or whatever, and, uh, and we'd have your picture and your signature maybe. Who knows? How, how would it start? Well, today it's actually illegal to operate a bank without deposit insurance, but it would be interesting to allow banks at least the option to say, put a sticker in the window that says, not protected by the FDIC, uh, but... We issue our own currency. And we issue our own currency, but they would have to provide the public with enough information about the way the bank is run and what the balance sheet looks like mm -hmm. uh, to reassure them. And, of course, most people wouldn't read the balance sheet, but they would read in the Wall Street Journal or some publication they respect reports about how healthy the bank is. And if this did work, to, to the credit of the theory, if it did work, mm -hmm. in a sense, it would be more honest and ethical than what we've got. Because as you say, these protections for the public are yeah. in fact also protections for, for imprudent bankers. That's right. The Wall Street guys that, that you know, fool around. Yeah, but we know it can work. We've got lots of historical evidence that it has worked. Bringing it back into the present, that's a, a tricky problem because we've got so many protections on banks and they've adapted in so many ways that uh, it's a matter of, you know, cutting the wires in the right order <laughs> to diffuse the moral hazard bomb we've got on our hands. And do you put any faith in rival currencies like the Bitcoin and so on there? You can see there's efforts in the economy to go to something simpler and, and, and maybe more reliable, and yet at the same time it's very new. Um, do you think any of that will come to fruition? I had a professor who liked to say, I don't put faith in the market, I have evidence in the market. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wise but, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in Bitcoin. It, it's just a fascinating project. Uh, and people ought to be free to use it. It's, it remains to be seen whether it will actually take off as a widely used currency. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gone from zero to being worth billions of dollars, yeah. so that's impressive enough. Yes. But it's not much used as a medium of payment. I used to say I never met anybody whose salary was paid in Bitcoin, and then I met somebody who worked for, for the Bitcoin Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> so I have met one person. But... Uh, there are lots of firms now trying to make it easier to use. They, they intermediate between the firm that doesn't really want to hold Bitcoin overnight uh -huh. and the customer who wants to pay in Bitcoin. So the company uh, Coinbase, for example, uh, will take the Bitcoin and pay the firm in dollars. So it's just like... Uh, a foreign currency. It's just like using a f credit card when your yeah. bank account is in a foreign currency, yeah. And, and uh, you mentioned the chicken and egg problem. That, too, is really cultural. You say you need critical mass because yeah. people want to be able to take that paycheck and use it right away and spend it the way they want. But then you'll never, but for that, there has to be a lot of those people and a lot of those dollars, and, That's there, right. and there isn't. So it's cultural so that, as much as it's economic. There's a big advantage to being the incumbent currency because of this kind of network effect or chicken and egg problem. But we don't want to be too... Uh, pessimistic about it, we see evidence that people are willing to substitute into a new currency if the existing currency is bad enough. So in a sense, we should hope that Bitcoin never takes off because mm -hmm. that would be a symptom yeah. that the dollar is in bad shape. 
But in Latin America, when the peso of whatever country goes off on a hyperinflation, people immediately dollarize. And so they, they find a way to switch. Sometimes, even when it's illegal, they find a way to switch to a sounder currency. And Professor, we're going to end with our French chef question, which is one of our favorites. We did a series on cuisine. We had these famous chefs. Okay. And we'd end by asking them, OK, what's in your fridge at home? What do you eat at night when you're eating alone? <laughs> so your paycheck, what do you do? Do you go to your neighborhood bank? And do you do like everybody else, or do you have a better way? Um, I think I do pretty much like everybody else. I get a direct deposit from my uh, employer. And like everybody else, uh, I know that the bank it's deposited into is guaranteed to pay me. So, <laughs> so you don't worry. Not much incentive to move it somewhere else. Um, the real question to ask, though, is where's my retirement money? Yes, <laughs> yes. And... Uh, and the answer is I'm concerned about inflation. I have a, quite a large share of it in uh, inflation-indexed bonds. Huh. And then I only have to worry that the U.S. Treasury actually lives up to the promise. <laughs> Which it has to so far. repay yeah. me for the inflation on the principal. Well, good advice. Thank you. Long life and good luck. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Lawrence White was our guest this week on Free Markets, the Fiera series of the World Show. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. Thanks. Bob Scully's World Show was brought to you by Fiera Capital. The power of thinking, optimal performance, intelligent innovation.